Welcome back to another beautiful day in the Mesopotamian Plains. So today we're going to be looking at the Neo-Babylonian Empire. So it, just after the kind of the fall of the Assyrians, who we looked at in the last lecture, and we'll be looking more closely at the city of Babylon, of which we will return to very many times because it is one of those incredibly important cities of Mesopotamia. But first, a couple of updates. So the paper assignment has naturally changed because uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Art is closed and the library is closed. So there are new options for how to get your extra credit. Uh, the first option is uh, essentially uh, you can draw the image of the object that you chose. Uh, so just attach that to the, the paper that you're already turning in on Canvas, uh, and that assignment will be uh, created on Canvas shortly, and that's going to be your extra credit for that. Uh, the other option, so if you took option two, which is the cultural heritage portion, uh, you can draw any of the figures from one of the articles that you chose. I, all you have to do for that is just include what article you chose and what uh, what figure number it is, so figure eight or figure 10 or anything like that. Uh, and this is only for if you haven't already taken a selfie with your object or with the two one of the two books that I, uh, that I put into the assignment sheet. Uh, and if you've already started to write your paper and you didn't take a selfie with one of the objects, you can still uh, do the drawing. So this is basically everyone has the ability uh, to get extra credit on this assignment. Uh, definitely take a check at the assignment prompt because that has been updated. And if you haven't already, look at the video that I posted in the announcement section, which has a, uh, a couple of uh, some more information there. Uh, for attendance, uh, after many emails uh, and kind of some misunderstandings, we've changed how attendance is taken. Uh, so instead of the fun fact, uh, what is going to happen is you're going to be asked to essentially write two to three, two, four sentences on something that you learned from today's lecture. Uh, take a check at the attendance prompt because that's going to explain it in more detail. And that's how we're going to be uh, going through uh, the rest of the semester with your attendance points. Um, and another thing that you'll probably notice is that the due date uh, or the due time, I should say, has changed. So now instead of ending basically directly after lecture, it's going to run through the whole day. So now you can kind of watch the lecture at your leisure and be able to, to start, pause, uh, go back throughout the video uh, to be able to make sure that you're getting good notes. Uh, and of course, with people uh, in other time zones, as uh, some of the students have uh, pointed out, it's a little difficult to be able to, to, you know, if you're on the other side of the world, to wake up in the middle of the night and watch the lecture and do your attendance. Uh, and that's just not what we're trying to go for. Uh, so the attendance will be due uh, on at the nighttime of the same day that the lecture uh, is posted. So for this coming Monday, it's going to be due on Monday night. Uh, and of course, the videos are always going to be uh, up so you can always come back to lecture and watch those. So if you want to, you can go back to the first video lecture that we posted from last week and watch that. Uh, the other thing is the exams. So the exam format has changed. Uh, we're not doing the slide IDs anymore, uh, but we are doing in the essays. So you've already done those and we're going to short answers. So this will be you know, about a paragraph, five sentences, six sentences, uh, of which you're going to be asked a question and you're going to answer, have to answer it very briefly. Uh, so that's not going to be the space for you to write a full length essay for these short answers. Uh, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for concision and for you to be able to, to answer uh, the question succinctly and to the best of your ability. Uh, so more will be uh, released on that as we get closer and closer to uh, the exam time. Uh, finally, the discussion posts. Thank you all so much 
for participating in those and posting your questions. Uh, that was absolutely amazing and reassuring to see. Uh, so thank you so, so much for that. Um, that's please continue to do that. I uh, will go on and answer questions. And if you can answer any of the questions yourself, uh, please feel free to go on there and answer any of the questions that you see. Uh, it'll be great to get some discussions going uh, because we have a little bit more time for it now that we're not uh, kind of beholden to an hour and 15 minutes two times a week. Finally, uh, I'm on YouTube now. Uh, so basically the other options that I was working on uh, just didn't really have as much, uh, I wasn't getting the quality that I wanted and the rendering time was absolutely astronomical. Uh, so you're going to have uh, good quality lectures uh, that are, you know, you're actually gonna be able to see the screen. It's not gonna be all pixelated. Uh, and they're on YouTube, so uh, if you found this lecture informative, please please make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, not actually, just kidding. Don't, don't do that. That was a poor attempt at a YouTube joke, uh, so we'll ignore that that ever happened. So let us look at Babylon. So the Babylonian Empire, uh, the place of the so-called Tower of Babel from the Bible. Spanned uh, essentially from down into the uh, area traditionally uh, associated with Israel and Palestine, down into kind of the border of Egypt on the Sinai, and of course all of Mesopotamia. So we have running from essentially what was the Assyrian Empire. They conquered them with the sack of Nineveh and moved all across through the entirety of Mesopotamia and controlled a very wide swath of land. But as you can see, they did not exist uh, for a very long time. Uh, essentially, it just was not uh, ripe for what the Neo-Babylonian Empire was uh, to, to be able to, to last for a long time. They were eventually uh, essentially destroyed by the Achaemenids of Hut, which we will get to uh, roughly at the end of this lecture and definitely in the next lecture. So Babylon was, of course, the ceremonial city of uh, Mesopotamia and had been the capital of the Babylonian empires since the time of Hammurabi, and you'll remember his fancy law code. Uh, and the city was then restored by their Assyrian overlords uh, after the Assyrian Empire captured them. Uh, so Babylon still remained a very important religious site, important enough for the Assyrians to essentially come and uh, restore it. And ne the Neo-Babylonian Empire, as I said, started itself with the sack of Nineveh in 612 BCE. Uh, which was essentially the destruction of the Neo-Assyrian Neo state and the formation of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And during the height of the Neo-Babylonian Empire was under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II. And I'm sure you have all heard the fun name Nebuchadnezzar because it is absolutely fun to pronounce. So the three important kings of the Neo-Babylonian dynasty were Nabopolassar, who essentially started the, the Neo-Babylonian state. Nebuchadnezzar, who expanded it greatly to that extent of which I talked about uh, just very previously. And Nabonidus, who essentially saw the destruction of the Babylonian state through no fault of his own. Other than that, he wasn't that great of a general and wasn't able to fight the coming Persians. Now, the city of Babylon is one of those just absolutely incredible places. Uh, it's basically composed of, for the royal sector, three main palaces. We have the Summer Palace, which is at the very north outside of the main city. And then we have the Northern Palace, which is more of a fortification, but also very much a place for the king. And the Southern Palace, which was the essentially the uh, main seat of Babylonian kingship. And the entire city, city, all the way from the Summer Palace down through the outer city walls and these inner city walls 
is around 900 hectares in size. Uh, and to put that into perspective, a hectare, a single hectare, is 2.47 acres. I didn't know that off the top of my head. I have it written down here. Or it is a square, uh, which is 100 meters to a side, so 1,000 square meters. Now, one of the really uh, amazing things about Babylon is that we have multiple canals that ran throughout the city, uh, branching off of the main Euphrates River. And these were used uh, for transportation, irrigation, and human water supply. Uh, and what's really interesting here is that uh, these canals essentially defined the city blocks. So they defined uh, distinct precincts within the city. And now this is something that we're going to see later on when we get to the Greeks in Western Asia uh, with a plethora of their cities. They continue uh, the same form. Uh, and of course, the Euphrates splits the Western and the Eastern districts in half. Uh, and what better way to have a, uh, a city than directly on a river? Now, looking more closely at this inner city, uh, the eastern portion, so all of this area here to the east of the Euphrates River, was the ritual center of the Neo-Babylonian Empire and of Babylon itself. In some of the Babylonian texts that we have, it is called the center of the universe. Uh, and the use of canals and the river itself, uh, in combination with the ziggurat and the high walls, replicated the first hill to rise from the primordial sea at the center of the earth. Uh, so this is very much so comparable to what we saw in Egypt with the Benben stone, with that same sort of primordial mound rising from the primordial sea. Uh, essentially exactly the same. Uh, and nine uh, monumental gateways pierced the city walls, uh, and the most important of which is the Ishtar Gate, uh, which is located right here connected to the palaces. Uh, and this is now in the Berlin Museum. And this stood at around 12 meters high, so 40 feet, uh, a absolutely monumental gateway. Uh, and this stood, you know, as I said, right next to the palace, but then it was basically the main gate for the processional way, uh, of which we will talk a little bit more about in a bit. So looking then to uh, some fanciful reconstructions of the Ishtar Gate. It stood, uh, its, its main function uh, has to do with a thing called the Akitu Festival. Uh, and this celebrates the Babylonian New Year on the spring equinox. And all of the gods gather in Babylon to celebrate. Uh, this festival. And the main processional route, uh, which we just pointed out, uh, runs on a north-south axis, and it passes through the Ishtar Gate, past the Nabu Sanctuary, and ends at the Esagila Sanctuary, which contains that massive ziggurat, as you can see in the background here. Uh, and this festival, this Akitu festival, spans 12 days, and essentially it recreates the victory of Marduk, the principal god of Babylon, over the primordial dragon Tiamat. Uh, and it basically has to do uh, with the renewal of kingship in the eyes of Marduk. So the head priest of Marduk, uh, at the end of the festival, strips the king of all of his jewelry and his clothing and slaps him in the face and essentially remakes mm -hmm. him as a king. Uh, and this type of festival, this remaking of kingship, uh, may ring a bell to you. Uh, and you might want to look at what was going on at uh, Luxor and Karnak. And for the Babylonians, uh, one of the really fascinating things here is that all of their gods entered the mortal plane to celebrate this festival. So they stopped whatever they were doing, their godly tasks, and essentially came down 
to Babylon and processed through the Ishtar Gate to the Esagila Sanctuary. Uh, and they basically, it was bringing the sacred directly in contact with the mundane world. Now, one thing to notice is that the gate is attached directly to the palatial complex. Uh, and we've seen this uh, time and time again with some of these other uh, palaces that we've looked at. As to where the main gate is very much so associated with the palatial complex. And the, these lovely glazed bricks uh, are replicated in the interior, interior of, the, uh, of, the, of the palace itself. So there's kind of, there's a shared iconography between the Ishtar gate, it's brilliant blue, and the, uh, uh, the interior, interior of the palace. And as you see here, this fanciful little uh, dragon-like creature is, uh, is the so-called Mushushu dragon, another fun name, and it is depicted as a composite creature with a scaled lion's body and four legs. The rear legs are of an eagle, and the, the sinuous neck and snake's tail and head draws heavily on uh, those primordial composite creatures that we've seen uh, before, like the Lamasu, the, uh, those we see on the Akkadian cylinder seals, and that sphinx from Hattusha. And this Mushushu dragon is uh, essentially a sort of uh, recreation of Marduk's uh, victory over Tiamat, but I uh, kind of imagined in a different way. So the Ishtar gate itself is made of a brilliantly glazed blue brick, and you can probably see it behind me right now. Uh, and it stood at that main entrance along the processional way into the city. Now, two specific creatures uh, are depicted on these gates. There is the bull of Adad, and Adad is the storm god who was both a giver and taker of life. And the bull itself, uh, the depiction of bulls, has a long history uh, with agricultural practice and fertility. Uh, but it was also a bull, uh, was also a, uh, a, a creature of a mean temper who was prone to goring those who angered it. Now, the Mushushu dragon uh, was a, again, that primordial dragon that was van vanquished by Marduk, Tiamat. Uh, and as I said, the patron, uh, Marduk is the patron deity of Babylon, and eventually it became his servant. Now, one thing to note about this is notice how the, both the bulls and the dragons simultaneously process towards the entrance of the gate, whilst simultaneously guarding it from the two walls that are facing away from the gate, like Lamasu. So what we're seeing here is essentially the procession of the gods, an image of the procession of the gods and their servants going into the, the, the processional way towards the Esagila sanctuary while simultaneously guarding it just like Lamasu. So it both has this, this kind of apotropaic effect of guardianship and this sort of processional uh, way that is associated with the Akitu festival. So looking at, then uh, at another view, you can see uh, the, uh, the bulls and the dragons who are facing away, both on the interior of the arch and on the wall of the two flanking towers. But then you can also see the bulls and dragons moving in and processing towards. And now this glazed panel that you see right here, just off screen, uh, is actually uh, from the interior of the Southern Palace. So as I mentioned before, how we have this continuity in both iconographic elements and color uh, being basically uh, transferred between this incredibly important ritual gate and the palace itself. And this small image on the side here shows the processional way as reconstructed by Saddam Hussein in the 1980s. 
So let us think a little bit about the material investment that uh, went into constructing the processional way and the Ishtar gate. Uh, these bricks are stamped in a low relief and glazed with specific colors to produce the desired re result. This shows an incredible investment of time and skill. Now notice how the relief, especially these flowers here and the lion, and again with the, the Mushushu dragon, uh, notice how they span across multiple bricks. So each of these bricks were uh, essentially custom made. They were custom stamped and then uh, placed specifically in those locations. And this is uh, really gestures towards a supremely organized system of construction as to where they knew the specific type of brick that they needed, what colors it needed to be glazed, and then they were able to organize to be able to get them in the exact correct spot. Uh, it's absolutely incredible just the investment uh, of both time, labor, and money that went into producing this incredibly, incredibly uh, fantastic uh, and brilliant structure. And as you can see, uh, with this, uh, the area around Babylon was not that uh, green. It was very much a step structure. Uh, so the colors were very much muted. And just to see this brilliant blue offset by the standard kind of tannish baked brick uh, would be absolutely incredible to behold. Um, and this is, uh, as you can see uh, here on these two images, uh, these were reconstructed by Saddam Hussein uh, as if you look back all the way to however many lectures ago, where we showed uh, Saddam Hussein's billboards uh, connecting him to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you will see uh, that he was again trying to do it through the actual architecture itself and not just through images. And if you get a chance uh, to go to Berlin, uh, definitely go to their museums because to experience these reliefs in first hand is absolutely uh, mind-blowing. It's truly incredible. And here is just a little bit more detail of, you can see the, the very delicate relief and you can really, really see how it, uh, how the, the different bits of the relief cross over all of these different bricks. And it just, it truly is uh, something uh, to behold. And these lions here are from the processional way on the north side of the Ishtar gate. And here is just a, uh, another image of that. And you can see um, essentially uh, some very interesting uh, reconstruction. And these are, of course, uh, in Berlin. So looking uh, at the Southern Palace, uh, the organization should be incredibly familiar to us now. Uh, we have multiple courtyards with intervening grand rooms. Uh, and the entire palace was built on top of a large platform which raised it above the floodplain and made it visible from everywhere in the city. So essentially you had the, the great ziggurat, the Atemenanki ziggurat, and the palace being the two focal points of the city. And now the Neo-Babylonian portion of the palace is uh, delineated by this vertical split here, uh, which is uh, just uh, to the west of the throne room, of the main throne room. Uh, and the arrangement of these buildings are dating to the Achaemenid period, uh, which are a bit later. So we actually see uh, a reinvestment into the uh, site of Babylon by the Achaemenid kings. Now, the first courtyard you see, we have the Ishtar Gate is right up here along the processional way, and then we have the main entrance to the palace here. Now, this first courtyard and the rooms surrounding it uh, were dedicated for the palace guards. So they had their quarters here, uh, and everything that had to do with the palace guards was located in around, uh, structured around this courtyard here. 
you know, then we see we have this kind of grand hallway slash entrance portico, which then leads into the second courtyard and its associated rooms. And this was for the administrative officials. So all of the day-to-day the -day tasks of the Babylonian Empire occurred here. And then you go through another monumental gateway, which leads into this major courtyard and the throne room, which is, of course, uh, for the royal house. And essentially, each distinct caste had its mm -hmm. own uh, distinct area. And you'll see that as one gets closer and closer to the throne room, the higher in rank they are. And this was something we saw with the Assyrians uh, and how their palace uh, palaces were organized is that the closer one gets to the throne room, the more important they are. Now, the northern palace, uh, not much is, remains or is known of its function. However, uh, there were numerous art objects that were found arranged in various rooms of the northern palace. And in combination with some of our textual evidence from the Babylonian era, suggests that the Neo-Babylonian kings were very much so interested in the past. So essentially they had uh, a museum, uh, a quote unquote museum uh, of which they stored these objects and they could kind of peruse at their leisure. Uh, but unfortunately, not much else is known of the Northern Palace. So looking at the main religious precinct, uh, this is the so-called Esagila, and it featured two distinct buildings, which were both surrounded by high walls with large intervening courtyards. And now you could probably uh, make a very good connection with Chogazamdil. Uh, and the Atemenanki ziggurat, which is shown at the top here, and is right here, uh, it was uh, basically the uh, this massive ziggurat uh, that was uh, very much like those that we studied before, and it stood at 90 meters tall, so it was an incredibly large structure. Uh, the other portion of the Esagila sanctuary is the Marduk temple, and this here uh, is something that also we've kind of seen before. Uh, and we could perhaps uh, kind of compare it to the larger architectural styles of Mesopotamia, and in particular, the Temple of the Storm God at Hattusha, and the initial phases of the ziggurat at Chogazambil. Now, this entire ritual complex here, the Esagila, uh, held a small lake, which was called Abzu, A-B-Z-U, uh, which represented Marduk's father, Enki, in the primordial waters. So thus we have this sort of dual symbolism present in the city. Both the city with its canals represent the first mound, as does the Abzu and the ziggurat. So we have kind of this dual symbolism. Now, looking then to a satellite image, and unfortunately, uh, there aren't very many good satellite images. You can see the remains of the main ziggurat, and just over here is where the uh, Temple of Marduk was. Uh, and this was excavated by the uh, German excavator uh, Kaldave in the early 1900s. Uh, but unfortunately, much of the site was ruined by the continual flooding of the Euphrates. Um, and you can actually, just right here, you can trace part of the wall uh, as there's some structures here, and then you can trace part of the wall of the sanctuary of the Esagila right here. And in fact, the uh, floodplain of the Euphrates, the actual old course of the Euphrates ran right along here. So it has uh, silted up and moved quite significantly uh, in the intervening 1,000, 2,500 years. So some things that you should be uh, aware of for Babylon, uh, particularly in uh, relation to the coming exam. Uh, you should be aware of the processional way and its importance, so uh, the coming of the gods and the Akitu festival. You should be aware of the Ishtar gate and its importance in relation to the palace and the gods. 
uh, the Southern Palace, the Temenaki Ziggurat right here, and the entirety of the Esagila Sanctuary uh, with the Temple of Marduk. And you should, of course, also be aware of the general layout of the city. Uh, so the east side being sacred, the canals, where everything is located. Moving then to uh, early Iranian kingship. So this is, we're getting into uh, where my specialty is, which is ancient Iran. Uh, and we're going to be looking at uh, kind of the time period that came before and up into the Achaemenids. And but first, what we need to, to do is to really understand what is ancient Iran and what formed the Western Asia and the groups and peoples who were there. So it started out, I will look first at the language because this really is our uh, greatest uh, look into who these peoples were. Now the Indo-European language group uh, centers around the steppes of Central Asia and spread widely across uh, the Asian and European world. Languages such as Latin and its derivatives, so Italian, French, uh, Romanian, Spanish, uh, Greek, Persian, Sanskrit, Armenian, and German, uh, amongst many, many others, all descend from the same, same language group and share many cognates, so many of words that sound the same and mean the same. So looking at the language tree of the area that we're particularly interested in, I, it first uh, starts out with Proto-Indo-European, uh, sometimes abbreviated P-I-E or Pi, uh, and then it then descends into Proto-Indo-Iranian, and Proto-Iranian. Now, these are all conjectured language uh, and are pre-writing, so we really have no clue as to what they were written like, even if they were written, uh, which most likely they were not. Um, but, however, since we do have those cognates from multiple branches of Proto-Indo-European tree, uh, we're able to reconstruct the genealogy of these languages uh, through systematic linguistic analysis. Now, the languages that we are interested in uh, for this section of the semester and essentially the remainder of the semester belong to the yellow and gold groups, so Southwest Iranian and Old Avestan and Young Avestan. Uh, and these are uh, essentially what we're going to be looking at uh, throughout the semester. Uh, and what's really fascinating here is that uh, we eventually come into New Persian and its various dialects. Uh, we have Avestan, which is incredibly closely related to Sanskrit. Uh, there is a very close genealogy between these two. And in fact, uh, these two phrases here from the Atharva Veda and the Zend Avesta are, uh, they both translate as, to which God should I sacrifice? Uh, and they show a marked similarity in pronunciation. Uh, we have Chazmai Devalya Videma and Chamahi Devalya Videma. Uh, and these are incredibly closely related. Uh, and there really is uh, a, a, a fascinating uh, connection between Vedic Sanskrit and Avestan. Uh, and there is so much literature on this topic. If you're interested in it, you can just search Avestan and Sanskrit and you'll be able to find uh, everything on it. Uh, it's super, super fascinating. But however, much like archaeology, it too has become a battleground of nationalists to cl claim some sort of racial superiority through their language being older or uh, their language being more superior and more beautiful. Uh, so definitely be aware of that as you are, uh, if you go and look up uh, the, the similarities between uh, Avestan and Sanskrit. So some of the uh, languages that we are going to look through uh, through the rest of the semester, uh, starting first with Old Iranian. 
uh, there's Avestan, which is Eastern Iranian, and it is the sacred language of the Avesta, so the holy text of Zoroastrianism, of which we'll talk about in a bit, and of the Gothas. So there is both Old Avestan and Young Avestan. Old Avestan we have uh, from the five Gothas, which are uh, known as the hymns of Zoroaster. And they are metrical prose, which is meant to be sung uh, as part of a ritual. And each Gotha is comprised of 17 songs. And each individual Gotha has uh, a, its own syllabic meter for singing. So we have five different syllabic meters of 17 songs each that relate to Zoroastrian ritual. Now, the Yasna Haptai Gaiti uh, is uh, essentially this Old Avestan text that was embedded into the middle of the Yasna, which is a young Avestan text. Now, we won't get into uh, the, the peculiarities between Old Avestan and Young Avestan. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the formation and development of uh, the language itself as to you know, languages continually change. Uh, we don't speak the same English that was spoken in 1700 England uh, or even 1700 America. Uh, so same thing with Old Avestan and Young Avestan. So uh, Young Avestan, we have both the Yasna, which are those kind of prayers that are recited during the morning sacrifice, uh, the Vididad, uh, which is translates as the law repudiating the demons, uh, and that survives in a word-for-word -word translation in Pahlavi, a Middle Iranian language, uh, and in a uh, kind of Avestan uh, text. And what's really fascinating about this is that with the Vidadad, uh, we have two manuscript editions which diverged sometime after the fall of the Sasanian Empire in 650 CE, one Indian and one Iranian. Um, so we will talk a little bit more about that as well. And then we have the Yash, which are also part of the ritual itself, uh, of the Zoroastrian ritual, and we'll talk uh, a bit more about that. Now, Old Persian is a Western Iranian language, so different from Vestan. Uh, so the loan words that we see, so words that are the same in Old Persian as they are in Vestan, are loan words from Vestan into Old Persian, and they don't uh, generally don't share uh, a genealogy unless they go back to Proto-Iranian. Um, and it was written in cuneiform and was the main imperial language of the Achaemenids, in addition to Median and Elamite, uh, and the Elamites uh, we talked about in the last lecture. So Old Persian is basically uh, only attested in the Achaemenid inscriptions, so major inscriptions, uh, and we have a few evident, uh, a few kind of archaeological evidence of them being used in tablets, uh, so tax-related tablets, uh, of which we will talk more about uh, a little bit later on. So looking then to Middle Iranian, we have Parthian, which was spoken in the northern parts of Iran and was uh, essentially uh, the administrative language of the Parthian, also known as the Arsacid Empire, and survived long into the Sasanian era and exhibited a strong influence on modern Armenian. Uh, Middle Persian is the language of the Sasanian Empire and is an absolute absolutely fascinating language and one of my favorites uh, to translate. And it survived long after the fall of the Sasanian Empire as the primary, uh, primary language of the Zoroastrians in Iran and India. And we know most of our Middle Persian uh, from their royal inscriptions and coin inscriptions. And uh, we have a, a huge deal. In fact, most of our, our written sources that are outside of actual rock inscriptions in coins, uh, our Middle Persian corpus comes from after the fall of the Sasanian Empire. Now, Bactrian uh, is also part of this group, 
and was spoken mainly in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India during the early part of the Common Era. Uh, and it was written in both a modified Greek alphabet and in Karosti, which is the alphabet that was used in India at the time. And most of the Sogdian corpus uh, belongs to the 7th to 9th century, uh, with Christian, Zoroastrian, and Chinese texts all translated uh, into Sogdian. Uh, so we have a, a huge kind of cultural intermingling uh, with the Sogdian language and with the Sogdian traders uh, of who we will talk about uh, later on in the semester. So looking at uh, just a few examples of uh, these, these texts, we have uh, Old Persian cuneiform, so very much something that we have seen before, all of those lovely little triangles with the long tails. Uh, cuneiform, very standard, we've talked about this before. And then with Pahlavi, we have two uh, very different uh, styles, well, actually three different styles of Pahlavi writing. We have inscriptional Pahlavi, which is a non-cursive script, uh, so the letters don't connect and they are uh, very much stylized and essentially made to be easy to carve into rock. And we also have the Avestan script, which is Pahlavi, but with added characters. So they added uh, I, a couple of vowels to be able to fully uh, represent the Avestan words. And then we also have Pahlavi itself, so book Pahlavi, uh, which is essentially uh, a 13 character alphabet, uh, and that's 13 inclu including alaf, which is the, the kind of the A, and uh, so 13 characters to represent all 26 sounds of Middle Persian. Now, one uh, example of this, and this is really one of the reasons that Pahlavi is so fun to translate, but also so incredibly uh, frustrating. Now, what we have here is an example of book Pahlavi, which the letters themselves represent. We have Alaf, uh, Yod, Lamad, which is this lovely character here, another Alaf, a Noon, so N, a Sheen, which is this here, the Sh sound, and we're getting this, of course, from right here, uh, and then we have Tau, which is this little fish looking fellow, a Resh, so R, and another Alaf, which is represented in two different ways, which is really fascinating. And so this is Book Pahlavi, uh, and this is how it is written. However, it's pronounced Eran Shar. So as you can tell, this does not match what I just said at all. So I uh, was really interesting here is that uh, Pahlavi, how it is written, reflects the spelling of an older pronunciation. Now, Pahlavi, uh, as I previously mentioned, was a devocalized text. So vowels were not realized in the writing. Uh, and save for the alof, which I mentioned before, the A sound, uh, and sometimes uh, long U, O, and I were also uh, written uh, with this character here. Uh, so this <laughs> lovely character can mean uh, a ton of different things. It can be N, R, uh, and all of the long vowels. Uh, oh, sorry, my phone is somehow ringing. Oh, I have to end that. Sorry about that. Um, there's also a heavy reliance in Middle Persian on a thing called Arameograms, which are loanwords from Aramaic that were spelled in Aramaic but pronounced uh, with the Middle Persian equivalent. So one example is uh, a the the word for king of kings, which is basically let me write this down here because it is super fascinating. Get a pen. So essentially, it was I uh, Malka Malk, uh, which is Aramaic for King of Kings. And so, if you see here, MLK 
Alof, Noon, and then MLK. So here we have the Aramaic part, which is uh, Malka, which is Aramaic for king, uh, and then the plural uh, suffix here and the plural possessive, uh, which is Middle Persian. So Alof, Noon is the Middle Persian plural possessive. And so we have basically king of kings, which in Middle Persian is Shahan Shah. Uh, so totally, the, the spelling is completely and utterly not related to uh, what is actually said. And one of the other, I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but it's just so exciting. But one of the other uh, fascinating things is that if you were to spell uh, Shahan Shah in Middle Persian using the actual letters that are supposed to be uh, so the, the sheen, the alaf, h, uh, a, n, uh, if you were to spell that, it actually spells demon of demons uh, as an English translation. So that's a really kind of a fascinating uh, little fact for you. Um, and really the, these, the, the beauties uh, of this, this spelling and pronunciation make it uh, so beautiful. Uh, and as we'll see later on the semester, uh, the spelling of uh, on coin inscriptions are even more difficult to read. Uh, and essentially, uh, we have to rely on where the inscription occurs on the coin in order to be able to translate it. It's, it's absolutely uh, fascinating. So moving then uh, away from language, um, if you're interested in language, definitely uh, pursue Middle Persian because it's, it's so much fun. But uh, going back to those uh, Indo-European roots, uh, from around 4,000 to 3,000 BCE, there was essentially a very stable pastoral existence. Uh, nomadic groups who would move with their herds and essentially uh, live the life of nomads. So it was conjectured that these Indo-Iranians uh, lived in the uh, kind of area of Central Asia and Russia coming out of what is uh, this area here, uh, kind of Ukraine and Georgia and the southern Russia area north of the Caspian, uh, moving into Central Asia itself. Uh, so this is very old and then 4,000 to 3,000, kind of moving into um, this area of Central Asia here. And they forged a religious tradition uh, that has uh, essentially uh, many of its elements uh, preserved in the practices of the Brahmins of India and the Zoroastrians of Iran and India. And this is seen primarily through the reverence for water and fire. And again, thinking about those connections in language, we have Avestan Atar and Sanskrit Ami, which is both translated as fire. Uh, there is chanting and sacrifice. Yes, you can see the, the Yasna and Yajna. I uh, being very closely related. And around 2500 to 2000 BCE uh, is where they get the use of chariots and metal weapons. So it is the time of war and battle and this idea that might makes right. And we see this very much so within the, uh, the mythic histories of the Iranian and Indian peoples uh, where they kind of connect to this mythical past of great warriors and great kings. Now, what were uh, some of the elements of this uh, religion and culture that was brought down uh, all the way to what we're going to be discussing with the Achaemenids? So they called themselves and their language Arya or Arya, uh, very little difference. Uh, and this is where we get the term Aryan from. Uh, and they were very much, uh, from what we can tell, opposed to those non-Aryan people that they encountered uh, as they expanded south. Uh, and especially the Turkic peoples who were from present-day Turkmenistan uh, and those same types of people that are now in Turkey. And they conceived of themselves as a unified racial group that was superior to all of the people around them. And they were very much a caste-based society as to where you had the priestly class, the warrior class, the agricultural class, and all of the people below that. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they were nomadic. Um, they essentially roamed the lands, following 
following the uh, production of uh, grain and grass for their cattle to eat. And they called their homeland uh, Aryanam Veja, uh, which translates to the Aryan expanse. And this really is uh, this, this all-encompassing term that was both where they originated and where they expanded to. And this becomes very important later on, this concept, uh, as we'll speak of when we get to the Sasanian era, because this is something that uh, they use to kind of claim this primordial kingship. Now, some of these interesting little roots, uh, more for your perusal, you can see uh, just how everything is so interconnected. Um, and you can kind of see where Tuesday comes from, which is really fascinating. So looking at uh, the religion itself, there is the preparation of Hauma, or in Avestan, Soma in Vedic Sanskrit. And this was some sort of narcotic drink that was uh, used in the, uh, the sacred rituals. We have a reverence for fire and sacrifice being kind of the main uh, parts of their religion. Of course, hymns themselves, so they used mantras. Uh, which were these uh, the sacred speech. So uh, if we think all the way back to that uh, Avestan Pallavi, how they had to add uh, letters uh, to, to be able to get vowels, and that was so they were able to fully and properly pronounce Avestan. And that's why like the, the, they did this is because uh, Avestan, this, the use of these mantras, uh, the words that they used were the, the kind of efficacious speech, is that the words had action and meaning to them. Uh, and the, there is discourse, uh, so um, all sorts of texts about cattle and farming, uh, about how uh, the, the, the things of daily life, of daily existent, uh, existence, eventually become sacred and important for uh, the religion itself. Now, one of the most fascinating, uh, there's so much fascinating stuff, but one of the, the really fascinating things here is that we have these two classes of deities. We have the Deva and Deva, Ahura and Asura. Now, the first one, Deva and Ahura, are those from Avestan, and Deva, Asura are from Vedic. And in the Avestan tradition, the Devas are bad. These are the, the evil creatures, and the Ahuras are the good creatures. Now, in the Vedic tradition, the devas are the good guys, and the asuras are the bad guys. So that's really fascinating that we have these, these the, the same term is in Avestan is for good, and, but in Vedic is bad. Now, this kind of comes about uh, because around the third millennium BCE, these two groups start to drift apart. Uh, and these linguistic and cultural differences, just like the Deva Ahura uh, situation, uh, starts to, to appear. And we have these tribes uh, moving down into India and moving down into Iran. So uh, around 2000 BCE, this is when they start to move out. Uh, in the one that goes into South Asia, they are doing the Vedic side of things, and those that move into Iran are doing the Avestan side of things. And in the 9th century BCE, we have the first evidence of these peoples of Medes and Persians uh, pop up in the uh, Neo-Assyrian annals, so where they explicitly mention uh, these people. So how is this related to today? Well, this Iranian uh, language tradition, uh, of which we get from Old Persian to Middle Persian, all the way into New Persian, uh, is, as you can see, very much spread throughout modern-day Iran, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, uh, deep into Pakistan and Afghanistan, all the way up into cent uh, Central Asia. And Tajiki and Dari are essentially Persian. So New Persian and Tajiki and Dari are essentially exactly the same. And uh, Dari is spoken here in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and Tajiki is spoken up in uh, Central Asia and Tajikistan. And essentially, uh, these are uh, the only difference between Tajiki, Dari, and Persian 
are uh, basically differences in uh, pronunciation and some small grammatical constructions, but they are mutually intelligible. So think of it as the difference between uh, someone from Boston and someone from Louisiana. Uh, they're mutually intelligible, but they have different, slightly different grammars and different pronunciations. So getting then to the religion itself, uh, the Zoroastrian religion, of which I've alluded to uh, previously, uh, is named for the prophet Zarathustra uh, and known as Zoroaster uh, in Greek, and that's how we get the Zoroastrian from. It's also known as the good religion, Zarathustrianism, Mazdayaznian, uh, or Mazdayaznianism, uh, fire worshippers, and Parsiism. Uh, so Zoroastrians in modern India are commonly referred to as Parsis, uh, and in uh, Iran they're referred to as Zoroastrians um, or uh, essentially Mazdiasnians, uh, that type of thing. And a little bit more about it is that it was quote unquote founded by the prophet Zarathustra. So he was seen as a prophet uh, for their religion. Uh, and scholarship has argued that he has lived anywhere between uh, 1500 BCE all the way to the early 6th century BCE. Uh, there really is, um, we don't really have much evidence uh, for when he lived, uh, but for uh, the Achaemenids and the Sasanians and the Parthians, he was essentially the prophet of their religion. And this, of course, is a prophetic religion uh, revision, so the coming of a prophet to kind of organize the laws of the older system that we've talked about before. Oh, and I should mention that this is a rather imaginative reconstruction of uh, Zoroaster as a kind of a Jesus-type vibe. So the key elements of Zoroastrianism should sound very familiar if you're uh, aware of, say, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. They believe in a apocalypse, so the second coming of the uh, saviors. They believe in a final battle between good and evil, uh, which is part of, they believe that their world exists in a finite time. Uh, so there is, uh, by their great god Ahura Mazda, essentially set this finite time in which evil would be on the world. Uh, and at the end of that time, a savior would come and rid the world of evil. They believe in the resurrection of the body. They believe in a last judgment of the soul. They believe in a heaven and a hell, but you are not eternally damned to be in hell forever. You will just exist in hell until the end of that finite time in which your soul would be renov renovated and purified. They believe that at the end of this time, the, er the earth is destroyed by a uh, molten metal as to where all of the mountains which were thrown up by the evil forces are basically leveled by molten metal and everything is purified, of which then uh, creation is renovated and brought back to its perfected good state. Now you'll notice uh, throughout all of the, the points that I just made uh, is that there is a heavy emphasis on duality, of good versus evil. And this is something that you're going to see continually pop up throughout the rest of the semester. So key uh, elements about their end time, so their eschatology. Uh, after the, the resurrection of the dead, so after the, the coming of the saviors and the renovation of the world, uh, souls are judged based on their character. Uh, and what's really interesting here is that we have a thing called the Chinvat Bridge, uh, which is this bridge that spans a vast chasm of molten metal and if your soul is deemed good, so if you lived the good life, the bridge is incredibly wide and easy to walk across. But if your soul is deemed bad, if you lived a bad life, it is as narrow as a knife's edge. And essentially you'll fall off into a lake of molten metal to be purified. Now on the other side of the uh, Chinvat Bridge, 
uh, you meet your soul, your ruvan, uh, and it's essentially your inner soul. Uh, and if your soul is pure and good, uh, your soul comes to you as the most beautiful woman you have ever seen in your entire life. But if your soul is bad, she appears as this old, withered, uh, hag, uh, this witch-type creature that uh, is essentially to, to uh, replicate the, the dirtiness and the evil uh, evilness of your soul. Now, at the end of the world, this, uh, these people called the Saoshans, uh, who are saviors, they come and they're born out of this lake of which we will talk about later on in the semester. Uh, and Ariman, who is the supreme evil deity, is banished with this demon Oz into the void. So the area outside of the known created world. So many of these elements of uh, which we've kind of talked about have been reincorporated and reinterpreted uh, supposedly by Zoroaster. We have the same reverence for fire, the ritual tending of it. Uh, so the sacred fire cannot be polluted by the exterior world uh, and it must always burn. So it's an ever burning fire. Uh, Halma is this, uh, this sacred ritual drink uh, which we don't know really what it was made of, um, but it was probably narcotic. And this was, of course, used during the sacred rituals. Again, the mantras, um, look and listen to this because I, once the, uh, the slides get uploaded, take a listen to this, and here is the translation. Um, it's really, really fascinating. Uh, we're uh, these kind of pre-Zoroastrian myths and cosmologies. We have the first man, Yima. Uh, we have these stories of these primeval kings, so these great kings who ruled the world and uh, fought with dragons and massive birds and creatures, absolutely amazing. And we have this idea of Farana uh, or Hora, uh, which is the Middle Persian equivalent, which is this luminous royal glory. And this is what is required for a king to be king, is that if a king doesn't have the Hora, he is not a king. And many of these pre-Zoroastrian divinities exist. So we have Mithra, who we'll talk about, Verathragna, uh, Middle Persian Bahram, uh, Anahita, Middle Persian Anahid, the goddess of water. Uh, we have a bunch of these deities that continue on, and we will talk about them when we get to them. Looking then to the Achaemenids, they were truly the first world empire. At their height, they controlled from Egypt and Greece in the west to Central Asia and India in the east. And they were the most powerful empire uh, to control this area. They were um, really one of those uh, major uh, shakers and changers of the world uh, because of what they accomplished. Now, before we can get to the Achaemenids, I, I know I'm just, I'm building it up. I'm building up the, the Achaemenids and their amazing uh, world. We have the Medes. So these were some of those first Iranian peoples, those Indo-Aryans to come down into, uh, into what is modern day Iran. Uh, and they allied with Babylon to destroy the Assyrian state. So uh, essentially when Nineveh was destroyed, uh, so too was the Babylonian Empire and the Median Empire. And their royal city was Ekbatana, uh, which is located down here in the Zagros mountain range, and uh, known in Old, Iranias, Old Iranian as Hama, Hamgamatana. Uh, I don't know uh, Median or Old Iranian, I apologize. Uh, and the Medians were uh, overthrown by Cyrus the Great, uh, who you might have heard about, uh, especially if uh, those of you who are uh, who know a little bit about the Old Testament. Now, one of the really fascinating things about the Medians is that very few, almost no, art or archaeological objects remain. Uh, we there has been many theories about if the Medians even existed uh, because of how little uh, archaeological evidence we have of them. Our major source for who the Medians were were Greeks. 
uh, who wrote about the Medians and uh, through uh, kind of Achaemenid and Assyrian and Babylonian inscriptions and texts that talk about the Medians. One example uh, here is from Herodotus, who describes the city of Ekbatana, uh, Ekbatana um, and as kind of this, this great mighty circular city of walls within walls. Uh, and uh, read this at your leisure because it is very interesting. And Herodotus, uh, as untrustworthy of a historian as he was, uh, still has some very interesting uh, kind of information about the ancient Iranian world. So looking at the Achaemenids themselves, we finally got there. They were founded by Cyrus the Great, who ruled from uh, around 600 to 529 BCE. And the empire was greatly expanded by Darius I, 522 to 486, and his son Xerxes I, so 486 to 465. Now, according to Darius I from his Bisatun inscription, which is seen here, this massive rock relief, uh, he ruled from the Sakai beyond Sogdia, so way up in Central Asia, uh, to Nubia down in Egypt, uh, and from India to Lydia in Anatolia. And their empire, their great empire of the Achaemenids was destroyed by Alexander the Great in 331 BCE. Now, finally, uh, before we end for today, we'll look at a bit of their map at their greatest extent. The homeland of the Achaemenids was in Parsa, which is modern-day Fars province, Iran. And the two kind of principal sites of the Achaemenids uh, in Parsa were Persepolis here and Pasargadai here. Uh, and later on, they take over Susa, and that becomes a royal administrative center. And we saw Susa before with the Elamites. Now, one of the, the interesting things is, as I will uh, just inform you for our next lecture, is the term Anshan, because Cyrus the Great, uh, he overthrew the Medes and essentially took on the title King of Anshan. So just like the Elamites had the um, King of Susa, King of Anshan, uh, so too Cyrus took that same thing. And uh, they overthrow the Medes and expand greatly throughout the empire. Uh, uh, they take over the Babylonians, the remnants of the Phrygian states, and eventually even control all of what was dynastic Egypt. And of course, they move deep over into India and Pakistan along the Indus River Valley and up into Central Asia, where we still have uh, those steppe nomads from before. So that concludes today's lecture, and I hope you found it enjoyable. Don't forget to do the attendance assignment, uh, which you will find directly next to this lecture. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me or post them in the discussion thread, which will also be included with this lecture. And uh, coming to you from the lovely Ishtar Gate, I will see you for the next lecture of which we get deep into the Achaemenids. All right, have a good one.